<laughs> Thank you very much, Asma, for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, it's a delight to be here um, and present and Thank you, obviously, to everybody for coming and listening, um, and hopefully you'll be here at the end as well. Um, so, yes, so what I want to look at today is um, some dynamics around this issue of religion, race, and culture um, in narratives of um, converts to Islam. And I want to start with um, an anecdote from an interview. Um, the interview was with um, somebody who I've called Gail, who at the time I spoke to her was in her 60s. She'd been a convert for around 18 years. Um, she was brought up Christian, although her faith had waned as she grew up. And our interview had come to an end and we had left the cafe we were in and we were kind of just wandering up the street before parting ways. And ahead of us, about 50 yards or so, was a group of women wearing um, shawa kameez, loose shawls over their shoulders, and sandals. This was a similar time of year to where we are now. It was kind of late February, although it was without the snow and the hail. And this kind of um, prompted Gail to, seeing these women ahead and the time of year it was, prompted Gail to talk about how Pakistani dress doesn't belong in the UK because it's impractical. And she further elaborated some other examples um, of what she referred to as culturally ignorant interpretations of Islam, Bible, Muslims. And one of these examples included um, a story of a Pakistani sheikh advising Muslims in Canada to wear sandals even in the snow. So this kind of thing that certain practices, behaviours, forms of dress, um, attitudes and so on are kind of held to be cultural rather than religious and at times culturally other to Britain is a kind of common feature in um, converts narratives. So central to the issue here is this kind of is this dynamic of between religion and culture that appears in converts narratives. And this, this appears in various ways. Where the line gets drawn between these two things is different for different people, but the, the theme and the dynamic itself um, is common to all. Um, and so what I want to do is explore this dynamic, and particularly in how it relates to claims or modes of belonging. So when it comes to thinking about um, converts belonging, there are kind of two um, main ways that this has been thought about. One call the assimilationist account, which is the idea that converts seek to belong to Muslim communities through a kind of performative conformity, um, adopting and mimicking the practices and behaviours of whichever Muslim community they happen to kind of live near, as a kind of tactical mode of belonging, becoming more like assimilating into um, that community. Now there may be aspects of this, and indeed there are aspects of this that go on, but this is in a way almost the opposite of the religion-culture divide and greatly underestimates the actual processes and negotiations that converts go through. So there's a second kind of account which is what I want to concentrate on and to begin to get to this, um, Olivier Hua has conceptualised this kind of religion-culture division um, as what he calls deculturation, whereby religious and cultural markers are separated from one another. And he suggests that converts epitomise this phenomenon. But what we need to look at here is not so much the, uh, this kind of discursive tactic of deculturation, but uh, the focus should be on, the, I think, the sociological process of reculturation. Um, nobody is, every, we're all culturally embedded and in a cultural context. So there's no sense in which these things can be completely pulled apart. So the important question, I think, is how this reculturation works. And one answer to that is the other type of account for how converts um, narrate and establish um, belonging in relation to kind of Islam and Muslims in Britain. 
And this is what I am going to call the exclusionist account. And the idea here is um, it's rooted in charges of Eurocentrism that are levied at converts, um, reflecting what some people have called the Protestantization or even the secularization of the faith of Islam in this instance. And on this account, the idea is that converts seek belonging through the exclusion of born Muslims um, and based on this kind of religion culture division. Um, probably the most prominent um, example of it, and one of the most prominent studies on converts, is Ezra Zurek's study of German converts to Islam. And she argues that in trying to attain a kind of pure Islam, in, in making this division, um, converts seek to save Islam from its negative associations. And that this leaves immigrant Muslims to bear the full brunt of the racialized stigma of Islam. And Saleh has made similar arguments in relation to Italy too. As Europe goes on, that defending the place of Islam is achieved by converts by disassociating it from the stigmatized traditions of immigrant Muslims. And thus she kind of concludes that as a result, it is safe to conceptualise white Muslim stigmatisation of immigrant background Muslims as both racist and Islamophobic. So, on Zurek's account then, uh, converts are seen as complicit in a form of Eurocentrism and Islamophobia, which reproduces the processes through which born Muslims are othered and excluded. That is, that in discursively securing their own belonging, in Western polities as Muslims, converts necessarily exclude born Muslims from the same kinds of claims. A problem here, I think, is that the foundation of Azurek's position subordinates and sidelines religion in relation to ethnicity and race. That is, that it, seems, it sees Muslims and converts more exclusively as racial subjects. Um, a kind of a slightly different statement of this is um, Ruth Mandel in response to Azurek's book and a response that Azurek herself assents to. She suggests that conversion to Islam is a form of intellectual appropriation of the other, which I think makes the kind of a reductive category error of seeing the religion of Islam as ethnically bounded and contained and related to particular sets of people who are defined ethno-culturally. And a problem in the kind of statement of this position like this is that it becomes not even so much about what converts do or say, um, it's not so much about the what or even the how, but it's, it becomes about the who that's the problem. Um, it's the fact that they are converts, it's the fact that they are white converts. Um, and more recently, Anna Piela has argued that conversion isn't a ticket out of white supremacy, as if that was some kind of reason um, for converting. I think there's a small kind of interesting and um, complex story to tell. And that if we look at the division between religion and culture as it occurs in converts' narratives, we can begin to see a more complex pattern of dynamics and multidimensional process, not one simply or more simply of black and white. So while my kind of focus will be more trained on this exclusionist account rather than the assimilationist account, um, what's notable is that in both of them, the religious is sidelined and backgrounded in favor of cultural conformity um, or a sim more simply kind of racial um, lens. Um, and what I want to argue is that um, doing this is a mistake and obscures important dynamics. And in fact, I could probably be stronger about this and say that these kind of processes can only be more fully understood by taking fuller account of the religious dimension and dynamics at play. Um, and the consideration of the religion culture divide demands that we foreground rather than sideline um, the religious aspect of these conversions and as part of the analytical lens um, and not just one that focuses on race. And what I'm going to want to suggest as a result is that there's another overlapping story to be told here um, that must at least run alongside 
um, the kind of one of converts reproducing Islamophobic discourses. The purpose of this is not to deny Islamophobic tropes or to defend them, but to suggest that the force of the conclusions drawn in this kind of what I'm calling the exclusionist account um, are reductive in relation to the religious. Um, and that this is a kind of problem where they simply see converts' religious experiences as bad faith narratives because of an ideological predisposition um, to ignore um, or denigrate that aspect. So, in order to get at this question of are converts Islamophobic, um, obviously what we're talking about here is who's in, who's out, uh, the issue of converts including or excluding. So the way I want to kind of approach this way of this issue of reculturation um, is framing this in relation to um, how converts decategorize themselves in relation to others. That is how, when, why, um, in their narratives they separate themselves out and make these kinds of distinctions along the religion culture divide in their narratives. So I want to start by exploring this how this decategorization works in relation to non-Muslims. Um, and here it appears in two main ways. The first is when converts may feel they are being separated from the category Muslim by non-Muslims. Especially if this comes to be based on a kind of narrow, kind of ethno, religious ethno-cultural perception of you know, who or what a Muslim is. And there's a story from um, Hannah's narrative that kind of captures this a little bit. So Hannah um, used to, well, maybe she still does, um, foster young asylum seekers. And then they would be placed in the local school. Um, and it was actually, this was a really important part of her kind of coming to Islam, but that's another story. And the school didn't really want to take any more asylum seekers, but because they had this long-standing um, relationship with Hannah, they agreed to take one more, as she had just fostered um, a, a kind of uh, one more um, um, boy, a teenage boy. And she tells the story of going up to speak to the head teacher about this. Um, and so she says, um, she says, OK, this is the head teacher. Can I have a quick word? I'm going to take him. Yes, I'll take him for you. But do you know that I've got 13 of them? 13 of them, Hannah replied. 13 Muslims, the head teacher replied. And so Hannah was wondering, you know, okay, Muslims, what's that? And Hannah kind of responds, and it's kind of, her kind of response here is like, well, what's this? That she says that I almost had the sense that she was trying to get me back into her group. Like, you know, you're the kind of the white local woman who we know, you can't, you know, she said, I had this sense that she was trying to get me back into her group. So this was something that Hannah resisted and pushed back against. Um, and so this is one way that in the face of kind of this sense of being decategorized by non-Muslims, there's a kind of assertion of a Muslim identity. For another, the other way in, this, in which this occurs, we can go back to Gail's narrative um, for a kind of an example. And Gail's recounting a trip to London. Um, she's going to visit her son. This is not long after the 7-7 bombings in 2015. And when she arrives, under pressure from her son, she's, um, she wears a headscarf, and she arrives and under pressure from her son, because he's very aware of kind of the general atmosphere, um, she removes her headscarf in order to pass through the streets unharassed. But then she relates how she's on the tube um, and on gets a Muslim man with his lunch. And everyone starts staring at him and just kind of a palpable atmosphere of kind of general suspicion and some disgust and things like this. And how this produces a sense of deep felt shame in, um, in her because of the way that she feels that she should be sat there next to him she should be getting those looks as well, but she's not because she's hiding who she is. And that this makes her feel ashamed of herself. Following this, she put her headscarf back on. And in this kind of instance, I think what we can see is Gail here is displaying solidarity with the suffering 
um, with and as a Muslim. She had the option of not wearing it. She'd already taken it off because her son had asked her to. She could have kept it off. It might have even un been understandable if she kept it off for things like self-protection. Um, she would have passed unnoticed as Muslim by those on the street and she would have left visible Muslims to bear the brunt of racialization. But she didn't. She put it back on out of solidarity with other Muslims and crucially so as not to betray her sense of herself as a Muslim. So important here I think is also that this, she's this kind of the solidarity that she kind of ends up showing is also a deeply felt part of who she is. Um, and that this becomes a quite kind of explicitly and purposefully not just a personal matter of private religiosity, but a matter of a, a more sociological and political identity. And in, this, and in instances like this, when it comes to Islamophobia, um, and the kind of social and political issues um, that reflect the marginalisation of Muslim and Muslims in Islamic society, converts can actually actively embrace the socio-political identity of Muslim rather than hide from it. So in certain circumstances and contexts, um, converts will also appeal to this broader sociological category of Muslim in other ways too. Um, and the category Muslim is much more likely to be narrated in a kind of, in terms of a we in this sense, particularly when trying to establish the belongingness of religious faith in relation to the secular, um, and in particular, obviously, the place of Islam and Muslims in Britain uh, on kind of religious grounds um, and as not being some kind of foreign alien um, kind of threat or presence. And I think it's important to note here as well that converts suffer great loss, um, ostracism, discrimination and so on from family, from friends, from colleagues and kind of, you know, walking around the streets in kind of relation to I don't know, majority society, if you want to say it like that. And in terms of how they experience aspects, the places they live and the bus journeys they take, and all, they end up experiencing this anew and often in negative ways as a result of conversion. Um, so, in this sense, they quite purposefully do not decategorize themselves, in, even in a social and political kind of sense. So, that's kind of decategorization in relation to non Muslims. Um, other times, of course, though, um, they do disaggregate the category of Muslim and they stress difference in, underneath that category rather than kind of this wider. Um, kind of unity in relation to Muslim. And that is what we're going to move on to now and look at decategorization in relation to Muslims. Um, so we can return to Gail. Gail was very useful to give that sense of continuity, but reflecting things that come up all over the place as well. So let's start with a quote from Gail to get a handle on this. So she says, you get two schools of thought. You are either Madonna and everybody wants to be close to you, close to your skin, because you are a revert. Or, you're a leper. You can't be a Muslim, you're just pretending to be a Muslim, because you weren't born a Muslim, so you don't have the understanding. And it's going to be alright in a minute, because you'll go back to your normal. So in this quote, Gail kind of conveys quite neatly two main ways in which converts are often responded to um, by born Muslims. The first is uh, mentioned, hinted at in the first part of that quote, um, and that is that they often experience being greeted warmly for their purity on the basis that they are new, untainted by sin, um, and therefore um, that some reward can be accrued by being close to them. On the one hand, this can be nice, if a little weird, um, but it often leaves people f feeling a little bit functionalised. Um, some kind of phrases that were used for this were feeling something like a collector's item or a notch on the bedpost, an arrow in the quiver or, or as window dressing as it was kind of variously construed. And this is, they're functionalised but they're not greeted, they're greeted warmly for the kind of the, the good that can be accrued from being near them, not as an actual human being, as an actual person or a co-religionist. 
But it's the second part of Gail's quote here that's suggestive of something a little more serious. And that is that rather or not just being functionalized, they can be refused. And this may come in the form of intense pressure to conform or and or um, exclusion. So towards this kind of less benign, less indifferent end of the scale, converts can experience outright suspicion and rejection and be seen as religious impostors. And this exclusion is often based on converts' background, on their ethnic and cultural background, um, that they're from a different culture, that they don't speak Arabic or other languages such as Urdu or Punjabi, depending on which kind of Muslim community we're talking about. And especially for black converts, outright anti-black racism. And this has obviously become a more kind of prominent feature in the literature in recent years. In fact, ethnic minority converts, whether black or South or Southeast Asian, often suffer direct racism. Um, and something conveyed by um, somebody who ran a new Muslim circle that I spoke to commented on how they often need extra care um, as a result of the kind of experiences in this kind of um, vein. So it's not just about colour here. But these kinds of issues um, can lead to this, as I said, this pressure to conform to certain practices and exclusion without this kind of conformity. This can cause some to lose members of their family. Sometimes they lose members of their family because members of their family don't like the fact that they're Muslim. But sometimes the pressure to conform um, and the fact that they do pushes or can push away um, friends or family. Other painful experiences that come up are subjugation into domestic life and physical and verbal abuse. For some, this might even be accepted at first, where they're told to believe that this is how it is. They must endure it. Julia, a mixed-race convert of six years who I spoke to, she remarked that you start hearing domestic violence in Muslim families. You think, well, maybe I'm going through the same thing. Maybe it's supposed to happen like that. Maybe it's Islamic. Others talk about the cultural expectations, especially in relation to gender roles, that they faced when they are marrying and, and they are seen to, by their in-laws and their husbands as they are marrying into this culture and therefore must pick up certain cultural habits and behaviours and ways of thinking about them um, kind of themselves and their role in a family and society. Um, Rachel, for instance, remembers being told when I converted that women should always be quiet. They shouldn't laugh in the presence of men. They shouldn't smile in the presence of men. And she asks when told these things and when barred from mosques, her local mosque wouldn't let her in to pray. Is it really Islamophobic to challenge it? She asks. These kind of things can create an unbearable pressure to conform if one wishes to maintain one's faith, particularly in a social sense. At times, this kind of conflation between religion and a particular ethno-cultural form can even be an aggressive form of refusal. Um, so a practice from Sisha captures um, her being refused on grounds of her ethnic and cultural background. Um, she was told by a Muslim man that she knew, go back to your life. You're European. You shouldn't wear a scarf. You should be out drinking and partying. And I was like, Sisha says, I've been practicing Islam for this long. Who are you to tell me that? I'm a born Muslim, he, rep he replied. Sisha said, what difference does that make? The response, you're not Muslim anyway. Your mum's English and your dad's Irish. So this refusal is based on the claim that as a white Brit with English and Irish parents and a Catholic background, she cannot be a proper Muslim. Muslim here interpreted as an exclusive ethno-cultural identity you are born into. In reference to such cases and many, many others, um, people talked about um, religious abuse, spiritual abuse and convert abuse. And the interesting kind of thing about this characterization is that 
even when this kind of the root of this kind of discrimination and refusal is um, related to issues of culture and ethnicity and this kind of perception, it's this language positions it in relation to religion. That is, that the discrimination is interpreted by converts as claims against them as religious subjects. So the important point here is that what's going on in this religion culture divide in the narratives and this process of reculturation is that it appears as part of a dynamic multi-dimensional set of processes in relation to how converts go through Islamophobic experiences in relation to friends, family, society, etc. As a reaction against exclusion and discrimination from born Muslims. And as part of trying to stake a claim for belonging um, in Islam and um, as part of um, something that we might call British Islam or being a British Muslim. And in some of these situations, the claims of cultural distance can necessarily be a liberational mode of empowerment that enables them to escape a loss of agency or even cycles of abuse without giving up their faith. And in this way, it can be the realisation for some that, as Julia put it, I could be a Muslim on my own. And this is an important way of how they stake out their own position with Islam and often help to maintain their faith. Um, there's another aspect to this that's important as well. And that is that these, these kind of lines of critique, this religion culture divide, isn't only expressed toward born Muslims. Um, converts can actually aim it at other converts too. Um, converts who are perceived to be merely cultural, if they've kind of conversions of convenience just to marry but they don't really believe, um, or those who fully adopt cultural behaviours, they um, adopt all, kind of all forms of um, dress and this kind of stuff, when it's seen that they're adopting these cultural forms at the expense of the religious reasons, then they also come in for similar critiques. And this is so regardless of ethnic background. Um, Kate, for example, um, she kind of talked about how um, there's a lot of challenges for sure being a Muslim nowadays. But unless people like us, and I'm not just saying reverts, people who understand these, these values, and by these values she's referring to kind of focus, <laughs> I won't take that as feedback, the focus on um, the religious aspect. Um, um, people who don't understand these and understand the importance of it, unless we really start trading the dialogue around that, nothing will change. Another point is that converts themselves as a category are, of course, ethnically diverse. Um, and the discourse of the separation of religion and culture is consistent across the narratives, no matter the ethnic or religious background of the individual convert. It's not the preserve of white converts. And where a distinction between white, black, South Asian, for example, is made by converts, this is to draw attention to difference in the experiences of different converts based on those backgrounds, not to disaggregate the category of convert along ethnic lines. So in some ways then, the disaggregation of categories is a direct, in direct relation to the patterns of discrimination that converts face upon conversion and of course in relation to um, wider balances of power in society. Um, another important point here is that many of the kind of discourses, many of the kind of um, arguments and the points and the things that converts are making as part of this is something that is found amongst Muslims, born Muslims themselves, particularly young Muslims searching for a way between their faith, their upbringing and lives in Britain, including experiences of Islamophobia, their different outlooks from their parents, grandparents, etc., and how these things fit together um, easily or uneasily, as the case may be. And many of the points on which converts challenge born Muslims and many of the frustrations they feel in relation to belonging to Islam in Britain reflect debates within Islam itself, quite apart from converts being involved. Issues of religion, such as gender equality, sexuality, the role of mosques, access to mosques, leadership, imams, 
um, Muslim organisations, relations with government and so on and so forth, are all kind of part of these contemporary debates. And, and as an extent of that, it's important to understand um, the kind of structural and institutional context in Britain and how it contrasts with the situation in some other European countries. Um, Rold, for example, notes the contrast between Britain and Scandinavia. Um, and her research is focused on Scandinavian converts. And she says that in Scandinavia, converts play a much more prominent role in interfaith dialogues than they do in Britain. And she attributes this to the difference in makeup between the Muslim communities in the respective countries and the structural, stru no, structural patterns um, of how interaction with majority society is organised, especially in relation to the role of women. The leader of the Swedish Muslim Council certainly was, I'm not sure if she still is, but certainly was um, a female convert to Islam. In Germany, in 2006, the Central Council of Muslims, um, which is one of Germany's largest Muslim umbrella organisations, elected a convert um, as its chairman, a position that he held until 2010. And commenting on the situation in Italy, um, Sally points out that converts play a prominent role in the public sphere, um, owing to structural arrangements between the government and minority religion organisations. In Britain, by contrast, converts are not in um, comparable positions of dominance or where they have the capacity to lead, shape, set the terms of debate at these levels. Although the project that ASMA <laughs> is leading will kind of be looking at those kind of issues in more detail and what's going on and what's changing. Um, in fact, at organisational and institutional levels, just 0.3% of mosques have even one convert on the committee or at all involved in the running of the mosque. Um, and Matthew um, was describing this situation and how he was trying to become involved with local mosques but was continually blocked and refused. Um, and how he might end up having to set up something of his own um, because of this. But at least when I spoke to him, he said he was going to give it one more shot before kind of taking that kind of that route. So what these kind of things help to bring into sharper focus is this question of how do we see converts? Are they primarily ethnically and culturally other and therefore their position in these debates is safely racist and Islamophobic? Or are they Muslims? Are they co-religionists who have a shared stake in these debates? As I said, this is not to do away with issues of racism or to suggest that what we're looking at here is somehow post-racial. But it's to highlight that what we think about religion, its importance, how seriously we take it, makes an important difference to how we read these things and what we think is going on. I, for one, think that sociologists need to take more seriously um, the issue of religion if they're not to entirely obscure their object of study, and more importantly, the subjects, that is the people they are studying, and to avoid crude binaries. And what it might in fact reflect is, to quote, or to steal Salma Yacoub's quote, that how you view Islamophobia depends on how you view Islam. How much time have I got, Asma? You have got under the five minutes left. Perfect. Okay, so just to really eke this point out a little bit, um, and just wrap some of this up. I want to just kind of pick this up, well, just some of what I've been talking about, and put this in relation to um, these five tests that Tarek Madud has recently proposed as a way of trying to assess whether something is safely, that's not his word, Islamophobic, or whether it is a kind of legitimate form of criticism um, of um, religious or cultural practices um, that, that should be seen precisely as legitimate and should be engaged with rather than um, cast as um, simply racist and Islamophobic. So, Madhu posts, um, poses three, these five tests. So to round up, very quickly take each one of them and think about converts in relation to them. So the first one, does it stereotype Muslims by assuming they all think the same? For this indicator, for this to be an indicator of Islamophobia, the answer would have to be yes. But I think in converse discourse, we do not find that um, all Muslims are seen to kind of be 
um, blameworthy and it's a problem. Stereotypes do appear and they can appear in ways that suggest um, this kind of thing is going on. But the religion culture divide serves to delineate between Muslims, not against them. Rightly or wrongly, between, not against. Um, and so I think it doesn't really suggest that Muslims, I mean, they certainly don't suggest that Muslims have no worthy characteristics. Were this the case, why would they convert? Um, it, and it would underplay the serious changes that they go through in their lives. Second test, is it about Muslims or a dialogue with Muslims with which they would wish to join in? I think, well, an important part of what's going on in the narratives is bound up with converts being excluded rather than seeking to exclude. Um, their claims represent claims to belong, to be part of. Um, two more minutes. This dialogue. <laughs> and th that thing about Matthew wanting to give it one more shot is an example of this. It's an attempt to engage, to be part of, and only separating um, if the barriers are just too big. Third question. Do the terms of the debate allow possible mutual learning? I think here, well, here we have to say the answer is yes. Um, examples of how converts position themselves um, as distant from majority culture on various grounds, kind of, they contrast this with the lifestyle and framework for social life that Islam holds out to them. This is an important part of the attraction, why they convert. Um, and it's precisely wanting to enter into the debates, wanting to be seen as legitimately Muslim is an important part of what's going on here. It is about mutual learning. And they often, particularly in the early days, look um, to Muslims, um, born Muslims that is, in order to try and learn and help them learn. Is the language civil and contextually appropriate? Um, this is possibly the most difficult to adjudicate on, certainly based on the narratives I have, partly because they're not public pronouncements, they're not part of um, public debates, they're deeply felt emotional and personal testimonies of experience rather than public debates. But I think, you know, at times it's yes, at times it's no, um, but it's not exclusively no. And there's certain examples where converts then enter the kind of more social or political space um, when things, this kind of things change. As I say, the kind of narratives I had were of a different kind of order, really. And the last test is, are they insincere criticism for ulterior motives? Um, I think the answer here is quite clearly no. Um, converts care deeply about the issues they're criticising as Muslims, as belonging in Islam. Um, their position, and their position is varied, but their position, they're not simple forms of attack. Um, they are, as I said, claims to belong and to contribute to a living and vibrant faith tradition. And importantly, to try and affirm a kind of um, religious kind of subjecthood. So that is me done. Thank you very much.